But what I think is very interesting is that some people just say that Mary is deified by making her queen of heaven or, you know, we're putting her on par with Jesus, when in fact, it's as simple, it's as, simple as the Old Testament kings had their mothers as queens. All the kings in the line of David had their mothers as the queen, and Jesus is a king in the line of David, and so his mother would be the queen. It has nothing to do with adoring her or worshiping her or elevating her to a higher status than Jesus or anything like that. I mean, I think that's so biblically simple, and it makes sense. That's right. But really, since we're talking about her queenship, the third and final type of Christ and Mary is Solomon, the son of David the first individual in the Hebrew Bible to be called the Son of God, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Mashiach, the Messiah. And yet his mother becomes the Queen Mother, which wasn't that exceptional or strange, because in the ancient Near East, there are other kingdoms that have monarchs, but the monarch doesn't rule alone, but the Blessed Virgin Mary is, in a certain sense, the Queen of Heaven, but you have, besides the mother of Solomon, many other monarchies had queen mothers. In fact, it's somewhat of a commonplace in ancient Near Eastern kingdoms, dynasties, and monarchies. In at the end of chapter 11, in Revelation 11, verse 19, you have a statement, a declaration by the prophetic seer, the prophet John, in verse 19, we read, then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. And it's hard for me to convey to our viewers what a stupendous piece of information that would have been to the Jewish Christian readers, especially because the ark of the covenant had gone missing, literally for centuries, ever since Jeremiah took it out before the Babylonians could destroy the temple and desecrate the ark. And this is the basis for Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, what Harrison Ford is finding in the ark. But of course, it was lost and never found. What John is describing is not a, a box made of acacia wood covered with gold containing the word of God in stone tablets. He's describing how the heavenly temple, not the earthly, in the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly, is revealing this, the ark of God's covenant, the ark of the new covenant. And, you know, Jews would be just stopping in their tracks. They would be breathless. Where is it? What condition is it in? How do we fetch it? This is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, yeah, but more than that. Because in the next verse or two, he goes on to describe a great sign that appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. That's fine. That's a beautiful sign, a woman. But go back to the Ark. You just changed the subject. No, he didn't change the subject. He didn't change his lane. He's talking about the Ark of the New Covenant. In this case, she is the woman clothed with the sun. The moon is under her feet, and she's crowned with 12 stars, and she's crying out, giving birth to the male child, the Messiah, who is to rule all of the nations with a rod of iron straight out of the Davidic Messianic, Messianic Psalm, Psalm 2. And then the ancient serpent is attacking her. Just as the ancient serpent attacked the first Eve and Adam and took them out, only now the ancient serpent is attacking the new Adam and the new Eve, and he is defeated and cast out of heaven. Likewise, you have the new Exodus, the Lamb of God, the new Passover, but along with that, you have not only the new Moses leading a greater and new Exodus, but the Ark of the New Covenant, and you have the Son of David, the Son of God, the King of Nations, in the heavenly Jerusalem, and you also have the woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and she's crowned with 12 stars. What are those 12 stars? The zodiac? Hardly. They're the 12 tribes of Israel. And so she is the queen mother of the son of David, who is the king of Israel, and of all the nations, this woman is obviously a type of the church, and in a certain sense representing the synagogue, but the church is called to be a virgin bride, utterly pure, as well as a fruitful mother. Well, how can you be both a pure bride and a fruitful mother? Well, there's only one woman who can answer that, and that's the Blessed Virgin, who is a virgin from beginning to end, but she becomes a supernaturally fruitful mother, our mother in the order of grace, in the family of God. And so, what you find here is what the early church fathers found. They weren't debating it. They were celebrating it. It wasn't, you know, 
it, it wasn't a controversial editorial. It was in their homilies and in their hymns. And when I discovered all of this, again, it just takes the gospel to an entirely new level. It's like the good news on steroid, only it's safe and utterly legal. Uh, last question, um, which has to do with this, but a lot of people think that uh, the Catholic Church um, has, con they conflate the fact that in Jeremiah 44, uh, pagans used to worship a queen of heaven. So they automatically just say, well, Catholics worship a queen of heaven. So therefore they must be the same thing, but are they really the same thing? Yeah, I mean, the pagans are basically following the deception of evil spirits. And the evil spirits are like apes. They're monkeys. They don't make things up. They don't create things out of nothing. They look at the work of God, take credit for it themselves, and then mime it. They, they imitate it. And so you'll find that pagan kings call themselves sons of God. And they also saw themselves as reigning on earth with the authority of heaven. Well, were they? No, of course not. But did the devil begin to crack the code of the covenant that God had in store? Yeah. So what does he do? Offer counterfeits. But it's not just the king as the son of God. It's going to be the queen as the queen mother, the queen as the queen of heaven. And the idea that you're offering bread to her, again, you know, this is a perversion. This is a counterfeit. You know, all of these pagan myths are distortions and counterfeits. But a counterfeit is a counterfeit of some kind of real currency. That's what the Catholic faith is. It's the divine currency of true divine sonship and true heavenly queenship. And so let's give the devil his due. He was totally successful for many centuries in many cultures when it came to counterfeit religions. But let's give the Lord all of his due, which is infinite, because he is the only one who creates out of nothing and redeems us by his omnipotent grace. And his power to make us holy is greater than our power to sin. And so to him be all the glory. You know, he has saved me from sins that I've committed he saved the Blessed Virgin Mary from sin, sin altogether. And so is she redeemed if she is sinless? She is the most perfectly redeemed precisely because she's sinless. And as such, she is the reality of the queen mother, the heavenly queen that the pagans perverted at the instigation of the deceiving spirits. Yeah, and we really could say that, you know, um, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu scriptures, is called the Lord. He's the only, you know, the Lord. Jesus is called the Lord. There, oh, oh my gosh, Jesus must have been taken from Hinduism. I mean, I feel like in some ways they're, you know, conflating the two in the same way. This is a good point. I mean, as an evangelical, I was kind of afraid of studying comparative religions. You know, you go back to uh, James Frazier's book. Uh, 10 volumes, The Golden Bough, written at the beginning of the 20th century, to show all of these parallels with Ishtar and, you know, and, and so he had lost his faith, and so he spent his life showing all of the parallels between Christianity and pagan religions. More recently, Joseph Campbell, the masks of the gods, and so on, and so once you become a Catholic, you begin to realize that myth becomes fact, as C.S. Lewis puts it, that these pagan myths are really watered down, stripped down versions of what the devils are watching. They're looking over God's shoulder and saying, okay, what is he up to? What is he going to do? What is he going to fulfill? And let's try to preempt that by mimic, you know, mimicking, aping it, you know, so as to confuse and to corrupt. And, you know, the light has shown and the darkness has not overcome it. And so I think the best way to study comparative religions is to recognize how truth is distorted through heresy and false religions can embody those distorted truths. But invariably, we shouldn't be surprised to find parallels, convergences. We should be shocked if we didn't find any. If we look closely in the fourth century, you're going to see in St. Epiphanius' work, the Panarion, the uh, medicine chest, a long list of various heresies, including the Coloridian heresy. We don't have much primary source material about the Coloridians, but the heresy of the Coloridians was a kind of excessive maximalism because they offered the sacrifice of the mass to the Blessed Virgin Mary and were condemned universally by the Catholic Church. Why? Because the virtue of religion is an expression of the justice we owe to God and that which we give to God and God alone is sacrifice. And of course, the word in Greek for that is latria. And if we give sacrifice to any creature, even the greatest creature, that is 
essentially idolatria. We give dulia, that is, we give honor to the Blessed Virgin Mary. But when we do that, we're just imitating Christ. Christ fulfilled the Ten Commandments better than any of us, but the first three relate to God, the last seven relate to humans, and the first of the seven is honor your father and mother. And as you probably know or remember, the term for honor, kavodah in the Hebrew, means to take the glory or the honor that you have and return it to your father and mother. Well, that's what God does to his heavenly father, but he does it to his earthly mother as well. So if Christ is keeping that commandment better than anyone, we're imitating him, not only by honoring our father and mother, but by honoring his mother with the same honor that he bestowed upon her. We don't want to honor her any more than he did. I'm not sure we could. We also don't want to honor her any less than he did. So the radical form of discipleship is the imitatio Christi. We imitate Christ by loving her as he did and still does, by honoring her as he did and still does. And so we do not worship her. We do not offer sacrifice to her. But I would say this, that as a Protestant, my worship did not consist of sacrifice. For us, the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary was over and done. It was a thing of the past. And so sacrifice was really, it ceased, it desisted. The only sacrifice we would speak of is you know, the living sacrifice of offering our bodies, and it's really an ethical metaphor for living a life, you know, in obedience to Christ. But if there's no sacrifice, what did we do in our worship? When I was a Presbyterian pastor, we sang to God, we prayed to God, we talked a lot about God. And since Protestants see Catholics singing to Mary, and praying to Mary, and talking a lot about Mary, well, that is the same as worship. Well, yeah, it's the same as Protestant worship because it doesn't involve sacrifice. I would propose that the Eucharist has to be a sacrifice when Jesus instituted it. If it was just a farewell meal, then Calvary was just a Roman execution. The only way that Calvary becomes more than a Roman execution, more than a, a heroic martyrdom, is by looking at Good Friday in the light of Holy Thursday the way St. Paul did. In 1 Corinthians 5 or 7, he says, Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed, therefore let us keep the feast. He's connecting Thursday with the Passover to Friday, which is the sacrifice consummated. If the Eucharist is just a meal the way Protestants believe, then Calvary is just an execution. But if the Eucharist is what Paul declares to be the new Passover, then that sacrifice is initiated in the upper room. It's consummated on the cross and then it's commemorated in the memorial meal that Jesus commanded, do this as a remembrance, do this uh, in memory of me. In the Greek, anamnesis translates the Hebrew zikaron, and that's the technical term for the sacrificial offering known as the memorial. It wasn't just reminiscing of something in the past, it was bringing something from the past into the present, and Christ, our high priest in heaven, is offering that sacrifice we're not repeatedly sacrificing Jesus in the sense of crucifixion. You can't repeat something that is never ending. And if Christ is a priest forever, he's offering his own glorified body in heaven forever to God for us and offering it to us on God's behalf in Holy Communion. So we're not sacrificing Christ over and over again. No, he is offering himself. And again, you can't repeat what is never ending in Christ. Priesthood and sacrifice are never ending. He's a royal high priest. And just as Solomon had his queen mother at his right hand with his queenly throne in the earthly capital, the earthly Jerusalem, so the greater than Solomon has a greater than Bathsheba at his right hand, forming this amazing union of covenant love that he calls us to share as we discover that God is Abba Father, but the Blessed Virgin Mary is his Mama Maria, but also ours as well. It is so deep, it is so theologically profound, and yet it doesn't just fill the mind with blinding light, it also fills the heart with a burning fire. You realize that when God is described as a consuming fire, it isn't about the burning wrath as much as it is about the burning love. 
His love is so much more than we can imagine. And she embodies that more than I could believe for many years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've shown today that the belief of Catholics, the theology of Mary as queen of heaven comes from the Bible and not from a pagan myth. So I really want to thank you for coming on to our show today and sharing your wisdom and your knowledge with us. And as a personal note, I've, I've met Dr. Han a few times at different conferences, and he really is one of the most intellectual people I've ever met. He's definitely a world renowned speaker and teacher and theologian, but he's also one of the most humble people I've met. I mean, if you meet him, he really does care for souls and he really does love the Lord with all his heart. So we are extremely Extremely grateful to have you on the show today, Dr. Han. Thank you for joining us. Well, first of all, you're so welcome. It has been my joy, a singular joy. Second of all, Brian, thank you for all you're doing for Catholic truth. And third, may the Lord continue to bless and multiply your tribe so that you get more and more viewers and we come to share more and more brothers and sisters in the family of God. Amen to that. Come Holy Spirit. And uh, thank you all for watching our show. Uh, I will link a lot of the books and uh, the website for Dr. Han if you would like to check out his work, if you would like to read his articles, if you would like to buy his CD sets or his books. They are a wealth of knowledge. We just uh, really just scratch the tip of the iceberg here today in this show. So I will link all of that down below. And if you would like to follow us on social media, if you would like to follow uh, us and support our ministry on Patreon or PayPal, it is all down in the show notes below. Thank you all so much for watching. Please keep us in your prayers as we are always praying for you. May God bless you. Okay, so...